Hi there. Uh, as Tobias says, I'm Alex. And the story I want to tell you is this. About five years ago, I got a job at the most read and maybe the most notorious newspaper in the world, the Daily Mail. For those of you who aren't familiar with it already, the Mail's read online by nearly a quarter of a billion people every month. It receives legal complaints several times a day, and it's infamous for publishing headlines like this one about how to treat people who don't want Britain to leave the European Union. Or this one, about a high court ruling perceived as slowing down Brexit. The Mail's been at this game for a long time. Here's a piece from the 1930s. If you look closely, you'll see that the main objection to fascism is that it's foreign and comes from Italy. So why did I work there? Well, I never really wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to write novels. But I'd reached my mid-twenties and then slid on into my late twenties without having written the bestseller I'd been expecting. Not only was I flat broke, but my friends were starting to buy houses and pull ahead in their careers while I had nothing to show for myself. So I got a friend to hook me up with a job writing headlines out the mail, expecting that I'd make a bit of extra cash on the side. And instead, I ended up loving it. I worked all hours of day and night. I'd sometimes leave shaken and trembling with stress and I felt more alive and more awake than I maybe ever had. Partly, that was the excitement of being in the engine room of this huge machine with rolling presses and shouting editors and the power to write headlines and put words in the mouth of the Prime Minister. Partly, also, is that headline writing can be a lot of fun. A perfectly weighted headline is as satisfying as a limerick. Uh, let me show you a couple of the all-time greatest hits. This one's about someone being found decapitated in a strip club. <laughs> um, <laughs> this next one takes a little bit more explaining, but it's worth it because it's so extraordinary. First, let me remind you of Mary Poppins' magic word, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Now, a few years ago, a tiny local football team from the Scottish Highlands, Inverness Caledonian Thistle, or Super Cali, beat the regular champion, Celtic. And the headline was, Super Cali go ballistic, Celtic are atrocious. <laughs> Composing something like that wins you a certain kind of immortality. There's also a lovely niche genre called When Headlines Go Wrong. And this is what makes headline writers laugh harder than anything that's supposed to be funny. Uh, take a look at this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wrote headlines, not as good as these ones, and amused myself enormously. I also got to watch and learn from one of the most extreme, ruthless, and successful beasts in the whole news trade. And that proved an entry into the swaggering, bombastic, and horribly powerful world of tabloid journalism. And I started to work in other places as well. Let me give you an example of the kind of craziness that I saw. At one newspaper where I was working, I'm omitting the name to protect the guilty, we were covering a change in the law that made it easier for Romanians and Bulgarians to come to the UK. This law was controversial in the extreme. The anti-immigrant press was talking about a tidal wave of thieves and beggars. On the day itself, we got a tip-off that a busload of Romanians were crossing the channel on a ferry, and we sent a reporter and a photographer to chase them down. By the time our guys got there, the bus was already off the ferry and heading towards London. That seemed fine. The plan was we'd accost them when they came down the steps at Victoria Station, take some pictures of them looking surly and bedraggled, as they surely would be after a bus journey the length and breadth of Europe, and then ask them some loaded questions about their intentions in this country. Those pictures would then be splashed across the following day's front page with a headline saying something like, is this the first wave in a flood of migrant criminals? But our plan soon started to go wrong because of the traffic. The bus was crawling towards London so slowly that it wasn't going to reach the city until after we had to go to print. It looked like we were going to lose the scoop. And so my colleagues did something borderline insane. They told the reporter 
to drive his car in front of the bus and force it off the motorway. Then he was supposed to give the driver some money to keep him quiet, get the Romanians off the bus, and take a picture of them lined up alongside it. As he started to move his car into position, one of the bosses in the newsroom lost his nerve and was like, make sure they don't cause a crash. And just to give you a sense of the atmosphere in the, in the newsroom, what the editor actually says into the phone is, screw this up and you're both fired. But they don't crash. If they had, you would all already have heard all about it. They give the driver the money, they get the passengers off the bus, and they line them up on the roadside. The only problem is, it turns out they're not Romanians. <laughs> there's some Poles, there's some Czechs, there's a couple of guys from Tallinn, all completely the wrong kind of Eastern Europeans for our story. So I do this kind of thing for a few years. And at first, I'm just really grateful to be able to pay off my student loan and move into a flat that isn't damp, and grateful also to be learning faster than I've ever had to before. But once my hunger to have a job, any job, began to be sated, I started to consider, and you may think I was pretty slow on the uptake here, whether what we were doing was actually just making everything worse. I don't mean the paper's politics, which I'd always known were somewhere to the right of Genghis Khan, I mean the actual style of journalism, the assumptions underlying the headlines and stories that we wrote, and that underlie what's published by every major news outlet I've ever heard of. I was a headline writer and then an editor. I was never a reporter. I never went out on the street with a notebook and spoke to people. And so I saw with an unusual clarity that every newspaper is a kind of sausage machine no matter how principled it is, and no matter how important the contents of that sausage might sometimes be. What I mean by that is that every newspaper has certain archetypal stories that it tells every day. For the male, that story might be immigrants commit crime. And if that's a murder in Oxford or some shoplifting in Wolverhampton, it's the same story with different names and faces. The Guardian, to take a very different example, makes a kind of sausage called rich people evade tax. And whether that's the Panama Papers or the Paradise Papers or Apple or Vodafone or whoever, it's the same story with different details. And if we take all our major news outlets together, what story are we being told about the world? Well, people are being murdered, the economy is collapsing, the streets are teeming with terrorists, the ice caps are melting, and the whole planet's about to burn itself to a crisp. Now, I'm not saying that those stories aren't true. I'm sure that everything in them is factually accurate, or at least most of it is. And nor am I saying that I want to read upbeat, optimistic, happy-go-lucky stories about one little girl whose idea might just change the world, because let's face it, it probably won't. Ideas only start to be interesting when people act on them. Now, I emphatically do not believe that uh, everything is basically OK, and we just need to stop worrying. But I do think that that cataclysmic view of the world is a distortion. What the news tends to omit in discussing big problems like terrorism and climate change is that we can do something about them. I could give you examples of this all day, but here's just a couple. Between 2002 and 2012, the number of people living in extreme poverty around the world was cut in half. Some 800 million people were lifted into a better life by economic growth and better government. Well, here's another. Since 1990, the EU's carbon emissions have dropped by about a quarter. Whether that drop is fast enough to avert terrible climate change is another question. But it's not like humanity is just sitting on its hands and waiting for the polar bears to go extinct. Or do you remember the hole in the ozone layer? Or acid rain? Those are big, ugly, complicated problems, and we've got them beat. Now, as I say, I don't think everything's basically OK. But I do think that if we only talk about problems and not what we can do to solve them, it makes our public conversation miserable and vindictive. It gives us a bleakly distorted view of reality. And wouldn't it be better if, instead, we encourage people to take those problems and do something about them.
obviously I'm not the only person that this has uh, occurred to. There's been an uptick in what is often called solutions journalism in many countries and across many publications, from the Fixers column in the New York Times to the BBC's World Hacks radio show. But this style of reporting is still in its infancy. People are still trying to figure out, as it were, how should this new type of sausage be made? Is it going to be a high-quality German frankfurter? Or is it going to end up being processed horse meat with a sugary aftertaste? And just to give you a sense what these stories might be about, it could be about how the UK is making big companies publicly state the gap between how much they pay men and how much they pay women. Or about whether electric cars are going to fix air pollution. Or about projects like one in the Danish city of Aarhus, which helps people who've come home from fighting for ISIS, offering them help reintegrating into society and even providing counseling for post-traumatic stress. It's controversial as hell, but it seems to be working. Um, now, this new type of journalism that I'm talking about, what can you and I, we personally, do to encourage a shift towards it? I also want to show you that I put my money where my mouth is, and now I'm not just someone complaining about how everyone else complains too much. First off, I took those experiences in the tabloid world, and I wrote a novel about them. I did that because, for all the criticism newspapers get, very few people understand what they really are or who works for them. I wanted to get down on paper the excitement and the craziness of the newsroom and to show people the actual machinery of sensationalism. So I wrote what I think of as a satire with love. I also had a very good time writing headlines to go into my fictional newspaper. Like this one, about how London's new tallest building, the Shard, is already in need of repairs. <laughs> or this next one, which is about the plot that actually unfolds, unfolds in the novel. Separate from that, I also helped set up an online network called Apolitical. Uh, which publishes stories about what's already being done to tackle these big problems. Here's one about that Danish project that I mentioned. The idea is to do reporting that's rigorous, skeptical, but constructive. And the other half of Apolitical is an online network for public servants to actually help each other implement these ideas. But both of these things are much smaller than what you can do. You may not realize it, but you have a vote on what kind of articles get published. Every click is a vote. Every time you click on a story about blood on the streets, you vote for that kind of journalism. And if you click on something else, you vote for a different kind of news. Now, editors are very cautious about doing something different because the principle, if it bleeds, it leads, has worked for a very long time. And also, to be fair, we've got to admit that it's easier to grab someone's attention with a disaster than, when the, than with the news that things are getting better. If someone says, your house is on fire, but your garden's doing very nicely, you only run in one direction. Now, all of that said, your vote counts for more now than it ever has in the whole history of journalism. That's because the internet means that instead of knowing how many copies have been sold of a newspaper, a whole big bundle of stories, editors track how much each individual story has been read and shared. And they pay attention to that, because the internet has also destroyed newspapers' traditional business model. I'm going to show you what's happened to the circulation of the seven biggest British newspapers since the year 2000. You don't have to be a news hound to see that this is very, very bad. I've done this for the UK, but it's the same story in Germany, in the US, across the developed world. And the reason I'm only showing you print is that newspapers make many times more in advertising from a print reader than they do from a digital reader. So every major news outlet is now looking for new ways to do journalism and make money online. This is the time in which a new era of digital journalism is being formed. This is a time when the new norms are being set. And if you vote for a better, more constructive kind of journalism, 
you've got a better chance than you've ever had of actually getting it. So if you find yourself avidly reading a story with diagrams of where the bombs went off and timelines of the attackers' movements and heartbreaking pictures of the kids who were killed, ask yourself, why am I reading this? Am I actually learning anything about the problem of terrorism? Or is this just a gripping story? And what kind of public conversation am I voting for here? What I suggest you do is read something else and pay for it. And before you navigate your attention away, find the reporter who wrote that blood on the street story on Twitter. Send them a message that says, dear so-and-so, I was gripped by your article about the terrible events in Nile City. I'll be sure to read your next piece on terrorism, but please, could you report on what we could do about it? And then you too will be helping to spread good ideas. Thank you. <laughs>